Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a cornucopia of Scottish history, folklore and turnips. I'm Jenny, your harvest queen. And I'm Annie, your turnip pulling archivist. Now you can say that again. <laughs> Do I genuinely need to say it again? No. <laughs> And in this episode, as part of our Halloween season, we're going to take a break from spooky stories. Oh, boo. To celebrate <laughs> the harvest season. Yay. And this is one of my favourite times of the year. We have a glut of apples in our garden. The rhubarb is finally ready to be made into crumble. Yeah. And there are sharp and sweet brambles in all kinds of terrain. From our local park to the forests on the cusp of our beautiful city of Inverness. It's a time of plenty. I love to pick the brambles and all the mushrooms that pop up everywhere. The leaves are turning to stunning shades of sunset. And just looking at them makes me feel like a wee warm fire is burning inside of me. Especially when I crunch on them. You sound like you're eating them and not stepping on them there, Jenny. It's harvest seasoning, Annie. <laughs> Well, let's crunch on over into the harvest with a delightful harvesting poem from the Elgin Courier in 1854. It is harvest! It is harvest! Fruitful season of delight! Over the hills, among the valleys, how the prospects glad the sight. Ply the scythe and ply the sickle, blooming maiden, stalwart swain. Frames wax stronger, hearts grow nobler. Reaping the golden grain. It is harvest! It is harvest! Garner up the precious corn. Fill your rick and fill your barns till the last load home is born. But be generous, O ye farmers. There is plenty, never fear. Leave for little Ruth the gleaners. Here and there a scattered ear. Oh, Jenny, nothing makes the heart feel nobler than a day of cutting the cereals and leaving a few extra ears of crops for wee Ruth. It is harvest, Annie! <laughs> <laughs> so the opening of the harvest season is the Celtic festival of Lunastal, or Lammas Day which falls on the first day of August nowadays. But if we go back in time to when this festival was being celebrated, it would have been on the 12th of August in the olden days of the Julian calendar, mm. which I feel is more authentic because if we're talking about ancient festivals, then I want to use an old and archaic calendar. And is the Julian calendar really such an anarchist? Well, yes. I mean, the way that the Julian calendar was applied in Christian parts of Europe was really confusing. Even the new year started on the 25th of March. Oh, that's funny, because that's when this year ended and we went into lockdown. Happy six-month anniversary! <laughs> <laughs> we went into lockdown on the 23rd, didn't we? Close enough. <laughs> Anyway, I looked up Linnestall in a book on Scottish customs by Ellen Guthrie and I found some really charming celebrations. Now, the book was published in 1885, but it describes practices which had long since died out by that time. So one of the most interesting Linnestall customs that I came across was hand fasting. Now, this is going way back in time as the practice really started to die out in the 1500s. However, it's an absolutely fascinating tradition. In Catholic times, the practice known as hand fasting was pretty common in Scotland. It was supposed to have originated from the want of clergy, but from habit was continued by the people after the Reformation had supplied them with ministers. OK, so what Guthrie is telling us is that apparently there weren't enough ministers across Scotland to be able to marry all of the young couples who wanted to be wed with the classic ceremony. So people had to figure out their own tradition and ceremony so that they could be wed. According to tradition, a spot at the junction of waters known as the Black and the White Esk was remarkable in former times for an annual fair, 
which had been held there from time immemorial, but which exists no longer. So this would be the Lunastall or the Lamaste Fair, okay. a big market that would be held by the River Esk in Dumfries and Galloway. However, there were Lammas fairs across all of Scotland. So the Lammas fairs would be a time where people from across the agricultural communities would be coming together to trade their goods, to make deals for the coming year, and just for a really good party as well. At that fair, it was customary for the unmarried of both sexes to choose a companion, according to their fancy, with whom to live till that time next year. This was called hand fasting or hand in gist. If the parties remained pleased with each other at the expiry of the term of probation, they remained together for life. If not, well, they separated and were free to provide themselves with another partner for another year. From the various monasteries, priests were sent into the surrounding districts to look after all hand-fasted persons and to bestow the nuptial benediction on those who were willing to receive it. So hand-fasting is a kind of folk ceremony that gave a young couple a sort of temporary marriage. It was like old-school Tinder, only it took a whole year to swipe left. <laughs> <laughs> so during the ceremony, the couple's hands would be tied together with ribbons or cloth, and this binding was seen as a marking of their union and togetherness. And because hand fasting was carried out at the start of the harvest season, it became tradition that the woman who had been newly hand fasted would start the cutting of the corn for her new partner. And because she would cut the corn first, this would bring them a blessing for the full harvest. In 1562, the Kirk Session of Aberdeen decreed that all hand-fasted persons should be married, with the exception of the Highland districts. The time-honoured practice of living together a year and a day ceased to exist shortly after the Reformation. So what's intriguing about hand fasting is that there was even a battle fought over it. Donald Gorham Moore hand fasted a woman named Margaret MacLeod and then decided not to marry her. Okay. Her family saw this as such a sign of grave disrespect that it resulted in the battle of Corinna Creeker. I wish my family would charge into battle whenever I got dumped. Oh, I would do that for you, Jenny. Oh, thanks, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> Just set you on them. <laughs> so like, You're really going to regret this. You jump out the boot of my car and chase them down the street <laughs> with a piece of corn. <laughs> <laughs> it's harvest season. <laughs> but speaking of battles, Guthrie also describes a wonderful, though slightly boisterous custom from a hundred years before she was living. So we can also get an insight into Lunastall traditions from the 1700s. The Herds Festival at Midlothian. About a century ago now, the 1st of August was celebrated as follows. Early in the summer, the herdsmen associated themselves in groups and each band proceeded to erect a tower in a central locality to serve as a place of meeting on Lammas. The tower was built of sods and stones and was generally four feet in diameter at the base and tapered towards the summit, which rose about eight feet from the ground. There was a hole in the centre for the insertion of a flagstaff. The building of the tower commenced a month before Lammas. For this month, one of the builders kept watch of the tower in order to prevent it being attacked by any of the rival communities. This warder was provided with a horn, which he sounded in case of assault. It sounded like this, toot toot. On the approach of Lammas, each party appointed a captain. He was entrusted with the duty of bearing the standard, uh, a towel borrowed from some farmer's wife, decorated with ribbons and attached to a pole. On the morning of the festival, he displayed this flag on the summit of the tower. The assembled herdsmen waited under his leadership to resist an assault of the enemy. Toot toot! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're seeing in Midlothian in the 1700s is a historic feud 
brewing between rival areas. Ooh. Farm lads and shepherds and cattle herds are gathering together to do this kind of extravagant play fight. So they build these big towers, essentially as a massive game of capture the flag, like which it. lasts an entire month. And I imagine that it would probably have been the shepherds doing most of the building when they were out tending to their flocks. Scouts were dispatched at intervals to ascertain whether any foe was near. When menaced by danger, horns were blown, toot toot, and the army marched forth to meet an advancing enemy. At some engagements, a hundred combatants would appear on each side. After a short struggle, the weaker party yielded to the stronger. But there were instances in which such mimic warfare terminated in bloodshed. If no enemy appeared before the hour of noon, the garrison removed their standards and marched to the nearest village, where they concluded the day's amusements with foot races and other diversions. So, essentially, the young men of the farms in Midlothian would be engaging in this big game, I guess as a tradition and a kind of competition of strength and power mm. um, because strength and power are very important in agriculture and sheep herding yes well yes <laughs> if you had ever had to carry a sick sheep jenny mm. you'd know how much strength you need to be a shepherd true and for this final fighting event on lammas day they would take a hearty picnic breakfast of cheese and other dainties from their farm and they'd have a great time Though it was always two rival bands to begin with, the day would always end amicably, with them all being friends. And throughout the following year, they would sneakily destroy each other's fortresses so that they would have to rebuild them for the next harvest season. Oh, I like it. I feel like it's a, it's a better way to get out all this tension, you know, and showcase their strength and power in a big game of capture the flag. So that's nice. Maybe that's what the world needs. Just a big game of chill out and capture the flag. I think as long as you've got a picnic with some pleasant dainties. Yes, lots of cheese is required. <laughs> some pickles, a nice oat cake. Probably a dram or two. Or three. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenny, one of my favourite stories about the harvest is from an oral history about Dunvegan on Sky. It comes from a man born in 1885 named Donald Sinclair, who was from the island of Tyree, and he heard this story from his father, who worked on the fishing boats. Let's hear about the wee free folk of the harvest, Jenny. Well, Annie, there was once a farmer in Dunvegan who had a big, fertile, idyllic farm. His name was MacLeod and his farm was so productive that he needed to hire lots of lads from near and far to help with the harvest. And generally, MacLeod got jolly and hard-working lads happy to work long days to ensure the crops were taken in well and successfully. And the farmer would treat them well too, with food and lodgings and, you know, generally everything would run nice and smoothly. However, one year MacLeod was short-handed so he hired three extra lads to work on his crops. Now he assumed that they came from far away, from maybe another island or the mainland, for he had never seen their faces before. However, they looked strong and capable, and so he was happy to give them a chance. Now when the lads arrived on the farm, they went straight to the barn where they would be staying. And then they didn't come out for a really long time, and it just got a bit weird. And when they did go out, they would just sort of investigate the soil and take handfuls of it and take it up to their faces as though they were smelling it and tasting it and trying to listen to the soil. Now, MacLeod had a big farm to reap, but these three helpers were just standing eating soil and sleeping in the barn. So, so what MacLeod does, right, is he asks some of the other farm lads that he does know to go and spy on the men. And so, one night, they creep up to the barn and start eavesdropping, and what they heard was very suspicious. The first man said, There is such and such in the bread. And the second man said, There is such and such in the wine. And the third man said, Aye, there's such and such in my cloud. 
when the farm hands reported this back to MacLeod, he was he was hurt and angry that his workers were saying bad things about him and his hospitality. And so he confronted the three men and asked them to explain themselves. Why are you staying in my barns and eating my soil? And so the first man said, Well, the bread you gave us to eat was prepared in the cemetery. And the second man said, And the wine you gave us was prepared in the cemetery too. So MacLeod asked what was wrong with himself. And the third man said, You are not the son of MacLeod. You are the son of a barn boy. And honestly, MacLeod was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but the men had eaten the bread and they drunk the wine, but they hadn't harvested the crops. However, after they spoke to him, they took out a banner and MacLeod recognised it as a banner of the fairies. The men hoisted the fairy flag on a pole above the farm and quickly a thick and unseasonal mist descended on the farm. It was as thick as smoke. And for the few hours that it covered sky, not a single farmer could harvest their crops. Yet all of a sudden, it passed as quickly as it had come. And when it lifted, MacLeod was astonished that all of his fields had been harvested by the fairies. His crops had been cut and neatly sheafed. Perhaps the fairies could taste a curse in the wine, or the bread, or he didn't quite know. The fairy men prepared to leave, but turned to MacLeod and gave him their banner. They warned him to never raise the banner unless Skye was in great need. And then they left, and they were never seen again. And that was the first day that MacLeod found out that his real father was not who he thought he was. But it wasn't all bad, because he also got his farm harvested by the fairies, which meant it was the first farm that finished its harvest that year. This is a weird story, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a bit of a strange one. One of the things I love about the story is that Dunvegan Castle, which is the stronghold of the MacLeods, very proudly to this day has a fairy flag oh. as one of their most treasured possessions. And there's a lot of different mythologies about this fairy flag and Dunvegan, though the flag itself that they've got on display is just a very precious and old silk flag from the Far East so it's perhaps not directly from the world of fairies. Maybe they lost the original and had to put up a replacement. Or the fairies had been to the Far East, got the flag, came back, gave it to the MacLeods. I had not considered that option at all, Right, <laughs> travelling fairies, that's their jam. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, the story itself is a bit of a baffling one because it doesn't really seem to have much of a moral to it. What I don't understand is why MacLeod was getting his bread and wine from the cemetery, though. And in the original, it's not just prepared in the cemetery, it's it's very specifically from the coppices and the shrubs and bushes of the cemetery is used to boil the water that's used to make the bread and the wine. So surely it's more hassle to get cemetery bread than it is to just pop into the baker's. Why is he making his bread in the graveyard? Okay, so this part of the story really baffled me too a bit. <laughs> And I'm not quite sure, but I think that it's saying it's made in a cemetery is maybe more of a metaphor to say that his his wine and his bread has somehow been cursed. Mm, it could be the ghost interfering with the rising process of the bread, you know, just giving that taste from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be that fairies simply don't enjoy human bread. Mm. Uh, bread itself is very symbolic and in a lot of mythology... Uh, people who cross over into the fairy world and either eat or drink fairy food often find themselves unable to travel back through the veil mm. into the land of the humans. Okay. So it wouldn't surprise me if fairies simply didn't think much of human bread and compared it to that kind of graveyard taste. Ah, if only this bread tasted more like soil. <laughs> <laughs> We are truly blessed, Jenny, for it is the approach of the harvest moon. I think we often associate the modern harvest with the joy of fresh crops being gathered quickly by machines. However, there's something so much more beautiful about imagining the actual harvest taking place under both sunlight and moonlight, 
as would have happened many generations ago. Yes, and I was out camping last night. We're a couple of days from the harvest moon still, and it was so bright. It was a clear night, and honestly, we could walk around without head torches. It was just, it was lovely. And the harvest moon has been considered one of the most important times of the year for thousands of years for this very reason. The harvest moon rises just after the sun has set, extending the hours of light, shining down in the early evening and illuminating the fields. Harvest time is where the people of the land reap what they sow, but they only have a small window of time to allow the crop to ripen as much as possible while also drying out the grains before the rains come. Yes, so the cold and wet weather that comes later in the year means that if you don't get your harvest done on time, then you won't be able to dry it out fully. And damp means that you can lose your entire crop Mm. or get a mould. So you really need a good harvest to get your grains dried. But the harvest moon is a strange moon. Not only is it full and bright, it is also in the sky for longer than normal full moons are making it seem like a true blessing from the gods of the harvest. Yes, um, and there are actually lots of Gallic Christian blessings for doing the harvest as well. It's really fascinating because they often incorporate uh, more ancient Celtic beliefs around farming and land with the kind of Christian beliefs. They're a really distinctive kind of blessing Mm. that blesses every element of the farm from the sickle used to cut the crops to every sheaf that they've cut. Ah, but it's not your blessings that create the harvest moon, it's the autumnal equinox. And our position with the sun and the stars and the moon and possibly the harvest gods did all this on purpose. See, the harvest moon is the only full moon which can change month. It's the name given to the full moon closest to the autumn equinox. On our ceaseless cyclical journey around the sun, The equinox is a time of balance. We are exactly midway between the summer and the winter solstices, when the earth is not tilted towards or away from the sun, but is instead bang in the middle. The term equinox means equal night in Latin, as at this time of year the hours of sunlight and darkness are equal. And Annie, is it just a coincidence that this big, bright, long-lasting full moon is right at the same time as the harvest? I think it's just the natural life cycle of the croft, Jenny. Mm. However, I did find this splendid description of the harvest moon in the Aberdeen Press and Journal, published on the 22nd of September, 1934. Beauty of a great harvest moon. The harvest moon will be seen in all its ethereal beauty this weekend, for the astronomical conditions are favourable for the lunar display. The conditions are almost perfect. This year, the rising of the moon and the setting of the sun synchronise almost exactly. Thus, the moon begins to give light at sunset and continues to do so until sunrise, when it sits opposite as the sun appears on the horizon. If the sky is even moderately clear, the moon will send forth its full light on the harvest field during the next day or two. Though night harvesting is not so much in vogue these days of up-to-date mechanical equipment as it was a generation or more ago, the glamour of the moonlight on the harvest field is nonetheless real. There is, of course, nothing mysterious about the natural phenomena which gives us the harvest moon, even though some of our farming forebearers would declare that the big beacon was placed in the sky during harvest time precisely in order to enable them to reap and gather in the grain in the right season before the storms of winter swept down the hillsides. And quite a merry job moonlight harvesting can be when the night is fine, when the sheaves are dry and crisp, and the in-gathering of grain goes steadily to the accompaniment of cheery blethering. The full moon, which thus sheds its light on the rigs of barley and oats, is, as the world knows, called the harvest moon. No other full moon in the year rises for so many days in succession so soon after sunset. The weird bigness of the harvest moon as it rises about the eastern horizon impresses the imagination. And unless the clouds hide the beauty of this spectacle, no nature lover would ever tire of it. 
Thank you so much, Jenny. Let's explore more of the harvest by moonlight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most widespread and noteworthy superstitions that passed through the generations of farmers was that of the Kalyach. Now we've talked about mythological Kalyach before. We know the Kalyach, or Kayach as it's pronounced in some parts of Scotland, as an ancient Gaelic environmental deity who built the mountains of Scotland. However... <laughs> 